All right, thanks for watching. And I'm sure in your linear algebra career, you've been wondering, well, why do we just take in inverses of square matrices? What about rectangular matrices that are not square? And in this video, I would like to show you rectangular matrices. They're never invertible, actually. So that's why it's interesting. And just so that we are clear on the definition, what does it mean for A to be invertible? A is invertible if we can find a matrix B such that AB equals BA equals to the identity. And we'll use this in a second. Okay. Let me show you why invertible matrices are not square, and let me give you two examples. No, must be square, and let me give you two examples of you know cases where this cannot happen. So let me show you first of all that a two by three matrix cannot be square. It cannot. <laughs> yeah, of course it cannot be square. It cannot be invertible. And you'll see this is just a model of the case where there are more columns than rows. Well, let's see what a matrix looks like. So a two by three matrix. See, lots of columns, not a lot of rows. And um, let's argue in terms of pivots. So if you check carefully, what does a row echelon form in this matrix look like? It might look like something like that. Best case scenario. So. Best case scenario, a two by three matrix can only have at most two pivots. So a two by three matrix can only have two pivots at most. In worst case scenario, it has no pivots, but it can never have three pivots because the number of pivots has to be less than the number of columns and the number of rows. So it's less than the minimum of the two. And in particular, well, since, since it has only at most two pivots, one of the columns has to be a non-pivot column. What does that mean? Think of it in the terms of the, solving the equation ax equals zero. If you have a matrix with just two pivots and you want to solve AX equals zero, there must be at least one free variable because the free variables, they're in the non-pivot columns. So it means AX equals zero has at least one free variable. What does that mean? Well, it means, remember that AX equals to zero is always consistent. It always has at least a zero solution. But because it has at least one free variable, it means it has to have infinitely many solutions. So AX equals zero has infinitely many solutions. In particular, it doesn't just have the trivial solution. So the most important part is that it implies that AX equals to zero does not imply X equals zero. And let me show you why this is a problem. Let me show you that if A is invertible, AX equals to zero must have just a trivial solution. So claim, if A is invertible, then AX equals zero implies X equals zero. So A must just have the trivial solution. Here's why. Suppose AX equals zero. Remember what it means for A to be invertible. In particular, you know there's a matrix B such that BA is the identity. So let's take this equation and multiply by B to the left. Then BAX is BO, in a body order, but here just a zero vector. So BO, so uh, if you apply B to the zero matrix, uh, if you apply B to the zero vector, you get the zero vector. 
you can just check it by multiplying b with the zero vector. And this is just bax. But remember, bax, ba was the identity. So you get ix is zero. But since i is the identity, it does nothing. You get x equals zero. In other words, if ax equals zero, then x equals zero is zero. So if a is invertible, then ax equals zero only has a trivial solution. That said, we've shown that for such a matrix where there are more columns and rows, this does not happen. So we conclude that this matrix cannot be invertible. In other words, for a matrix to be invertible, we cannot have more columns and rows, so we need number of columns to be less than or equal to the number of rows. Let's call this one. Because if there are more columns than rows, there will always be a free variable. Okay, what about the other case? Oh, one, one thing though. Uh, suppose you have a two by three matrix. Here's also another cool thing I wanna show. You can think of it as a linear transformation from R3 to R2. So from input to output. So what this matrix does, it takes R3, and squishes it into R2. Think about like a projection matrix or something. Well, let me show you that the determinant is zero because um, remember there's this nice fact about determinants which tells you that uh, if you apply A to a space, then the volume of the new space is the original volume times the determinant of A. So what we get is the volume of R2, so the output, equals to absolute value of the determinant of A times the volume of R3. Again, volume, not area. That's very important. Now, R3, well, it has infinite volume, right? And we have determinant of A. And the question is, what is the three-dimensional volume of R2? Well, R2 is flat. It has no volume. So we get zero. In other words, the only way this equation can possibly be satisfied is if the determinant of A is zero. And that's why, at least for this case, for rectangular matrices, the determinant is zero. Rigorously, in fact. Okay, now, here we have the case where there are more columns than rows. Let's now do the case where there are more rows than columns and see what happens. So now, let's do a three by two matrix. Cannot be invertible. Well, let's again draw a three by two matrix, three and two. Again, best case scenario, there can only be two pivots at most. So A has at most two pivots, which means, and again, because the number of pivots is less than the number of rows and the number of columns. But look, what this means is that the last row is zero. So A has at least one row of zeros. And let's think about this in terms of the equation AX equals B. Question is, is this always consistent? Well, not really, because if you have a matrix of you know, with two pivots and the last row is zero, you can always choose B such that at the end, you get a row of the form zero, zero, and blah, where blah is non-zero. And 
the way you construct B is just start with 0, 0, 1, and then go back to the original matrix, so reverse row reduce, and you get a certain B such that this system is inconsistent. So, because you can always construct B such that you get a row of the form 0, 0, something else, AX equals to B is not always consistent. Consistent. Again, because you can have a row of the form 0, 0, blah, where blah is non zero. And let me show you that if A is invertible, AX equals to B must be consistent. And again, by the way, the, the reason this worked is because we had f more rows than columns. Because there are too many rows, there needs to be a row of zeros. Okay. Claim. I think this is a bit easier to prove in this case. If um, A is invertible, then AX equals to B is always consistent. Well, before we use the fact that BA is the identity, now let's use the fact that AB is the identity. And you'll see, this is really cool. So AB is the identity. Apply this matrix to the vector B. So AB, B. AB, 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 oh. <laughs> so AB, B is IB. Well, identity matrix does nothing to B. So this is B. And then we get A, B, B. <laughs> A, B, B is B. And here's the cool thing. Just let X be B, B. <laughs> Lots of Bs. Let, let X be B, B. Okay. Then, indeed, what this equation becomes, this is X, and you get AX equals B. So this always has a solution, namely B, B. And that's why if A is invertible, then this equation is always consistent. And therefore, what made this not work is that we had more rows than columns, so need number of rows to be less than or equal to the number of columns. So that was two. And I think I raised the other one, but if the first condition was the number of columns was less than or equal to the number of rows, well, if you combine that, you get that the number of rows has to be equal to the number of columns. And this is, by definition, a square matrix. OK. Lastly, in terms of determinants, there's something kind of interesting going on. Let me just think for a second. So yeah, OK. Because yes, technically, if we have a three by two matrix, it goes from R2 to R3, to R3. Okay. So technically, okay, what happens is that the, we, ha we should have the identity that in this case, so the starting thing is the area. So area of R3 equals to the determinant of A times the area of R2. So we get infinity equals determinant of A times infinity. And well, technically any, uh, um, let's technically any value of the determinant satisfies this. So particularly if you choose zero to be like not, uh, um, 
sorry, if you choose the uh, determinant of a is zero, well, strictly speaking, you could still have that. But here's the reason people say that the determinant is still zero. Because there's one identity of a determinant that's very useful, namely the determinant of a transpose should be the same as the determinant of a. So people care more about this identity than this identity here. But what is A transpose? A transpose is a two by three matrix. So this matrix, we're back to case one. So because we want this determinant to be zero, remember by our other explanation, we need that the determinant of A in this case is also zero. So it's more of a convenience choice for the second case, whereas the first one was made more sense in terms of uh, volumes and areas. Um, all right, so hopefully now you can rest in peace, you know, knowing that we never take, you know, uh, inverses of non-square matrices because those matrices are not invertible. And I hope you like this. If you want to see more math, please make sure to subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much.